uh, taken by surprise by the by the size of the of the winning margin. Uh, I, I would argue that uh, a major factor for that would be the, the weakness of the contending uh, candidates. Uh, Song was uh, unknown uh, except in financial circles, and uh, and right from the outset, his campaign was. Uh, Perceived, I mean, he was perceived to be an establishment figure uh, put out uh, to ensure that there was a contest and, uh, and, he, and he would, you know, provide sort of token uh, competition uh, for Taman. Uh, the other candidate, uh, Tan Kin Lian, was better known, but uh, for all the wrong reasons, I think, and not least of which was that he was one of the four candidates in the 2011 election, but he performed the poorest of the four. And in fact, he lost his uh, his deposit. Uh, on the other hand, Taman, of course, is uh, hugely popular, uh, and uh, probably the most popular of 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 the of the PAP uh, ministers. Uh, what can uh, we? Uh, sorry, uh, the other uh, interesting question is uh, why wasn't there an opposition wave, so to speak? Uh, you know, when you get 70%, it, it must mean that some people who typically would vote for the opposition uh, voted for Mr. Taman. Uh, I think uh, uh, the, the reason why there wasn't a, a bigger sort of anti-PAP vote was there, there was no uh, centre uh, 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 on, on which the opposition votes could coalesce around. Uh, the, the, cent the, the central ground in, in opposition Politics in Singapore is occupied by the Workers' Party. Uh, they were not involved in, in this election. They didn't endorse any candidates, as is their practice, because they're basically against the elected presidency. Uh, so uh, much of the opposition support uh, was at the periphery, uh, and uh, to, you know, to do with the PSP and and, and the SDP, uh, and. I think the the leaders from those two parties who endorsed Mr. Tan Kin Lian obviously suffered uh, some collateral damage uh, from his uh, very poor showing. Uh, what uh, what can what what lessons can can uh, be learned from from Mr. Taman's uh, uh, big victory? Uh, I think if I was in the ruling party, I'd be very interested, right? Because one of your men has just achieved uh, an almost unheard of victory. So uh, they must be asking, you know, what was it that, that made him so popular? Uh, uh, if I was doing the, the post-mortem for the PAP, I would say that perhaps the PAP ought to be more Taman-like uh, to, to, to win back the, the votes that they have uh, lost in recent years. Uh, and, and I think that would mean uh, uh, being more likable. Uh, uh, instead of uh, you know being pat patronizing, uh, that would mean that uh, uh, being more left of center in, in your thinking and approach to problem solving, especially in the social and uh, economic arena, and maybe departing uh, slightly not too not too much of course, but departing from the stereotype of of, of a PAP leader, you know, being more independent minded and being more willing to express views which are slightly different uh, from the party line. Uh, all right, so that's the presidential election. Uh, the other interesting event was what I alluded to earlier, the, the series of setbacks that the ruling party uh, encountered in, in July, uh, the extramarital affairs of the ex-speaker Tan Chuan Jin, uh, the ride out bungalow affair, and the corruption case against is foreign. Uh, I, I don't have time to go into those, uh, uh, but I think for me, uh, more interesting than the actual incidents themselves is how the leadership uh, addressed them and what the public reaction was. Uh, on, on the leadership response, I have to say that uh, I don't think it did particularly well. Uh, I think there's still great puzzlement today about, uh, in the case of uh, the ex-speaker, why the, why the prime minister did not act as decisively and as forceful, forcefully as he should have when he heard about uh, the affair in 2015. Uh, 
Uh, I know he gave a reason for it, but I'm not sure uh, many people were persuaded. In the case of the Rideout Banglo, uh, you know, he he got a committee of, uh, to look into it, headed by Kyo Chi Hien, uh, and he said it was after the uh, two and the two ministers had requested for one. And uh, and again, you have to wonder why did he have to wait for uh, the two ministers to request for such an inquiry? And he he should have uh, done it you know, on, in his own right uh, immediately. Uh, on public reaction, uh, I think it was very strong, especially over Rideout. And I myself was particularly struck that, uh, you know, friends and people I know who are uh, typically very pro PAP, uh, maybe even, you know, card carrying members of the party uh, were very unsettled by, by this and, and uh, could not uh, uh, understand why, why, uh, why it took place. And, uh, uh, that it was just not the done thing, you know. Of course, they accept that there's no corruption and and maybe uh, in the legalistic sense, uh, no conflict of interest. But uh, in, in their view, and I think most of them are probably from the older generation. In their view, this is just not uh, uh, what ministers ought, ought to be doing. Uh, I, I'm I'm not sure that's how the leadership sees it, but. Uh, uh, if there's this disconnect between the leadership and the ground, and in, in this case, I'm not talking about the opposition ground, I'm talking of the ground that's fairly close to the party, uh, then obviously it's going to uh, be problematic uh, going forward in, in the future. Uh, finally, uh, let me talk a bit about the leadership transition, which is, of course, may, maybe the most politically significant event, the announcement that uh, Lawrence Wong was going to take over the premiership before the next general election. I think on leadership transition, it has been anything but predictable, right? Obviously, when uh, Heng Sui Kiat announced that he didn't think he was a man for the job, uh, it threw the timetable in completely out of sync and they had to begin the search anew. Uh, the problem with that was that uh, there was nobody who really stood up heads and shoulders above uh, the others. So there was no really outstanding candidate and you could say, yeah, this is this is a person. So uh, because of that, they took some time to decide, and finally decided on Lawrence Wong. Uh, uh, you know, Lawrence Wong wasn't even thought, thought, talked about, you know, three years ago uh, as, as a possible uh, future prime minister. Uh, and because of that, uh, you know, they've had to fast track now that they decided on him because he, he hasn't had time to uh, establish, you know, develop uh, the, 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 his, his uh, relationship with the people as, as, a, as, a, as a prime minister. He, he was known as the man who co-chaired the, uh, -minister, the ministerial task force on COVID-19. Uh, he did, I think he did very well. But uh, to be seen as, as a future prime minister and to, you know, to act as one and to gain confidence, I think that's a, that's a totally different uh, thing. So, which explains, I think, the decision to uh, uh, do the handover uh, as soon as possible. I, I think it will happen probably after he delivers the budget, uh, which traditionally is end February. Uh, Sometime after that, you know, the 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 handover will happen, which means that he will uh, deliver uh, next year's uh, national day rally. You know, and he needs that platform uh, to uh, uh, you know make himself better known as as the as as the new prime minister. Uh, so uh, the the plan must be, I think, to give him maximum exposure. Uh, so that uh, you know he he is ready to 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 rise up to this to to this challenge. I think for me, I think the the the, the issues with the transition is symptomatic of a larger problem in Singapore, which is uh, the difficulty of getting uh, good people, you know, capable people to to to, to join politics, and in particular the, the ruling party. I wrote about it, uh, I think, 
one or two years ago, uh, you know, that if you have a problem with with the the flow, uh, then it's going to uh, uh, surface at the at the very top, at, you know, which is the the, the the next prime minister, and and I, we are probably seeing that problem surface uh, sooner than uh, than uh, people expected. Okay, I'll stop there and uh, I'll be happy to take questions so, around those issues. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Fukuang, for that uh, excellent uh, sweeping overview. Um, you've raised a number of points that I think uh, need to be pursued in greater depth. But uh, before we do, uh, let me uh, ask the next question of uh, Rebecca. Uh, one of the issues that you brought up, uh, Fukuang, was the cost transition. I want to um, uh, pose this question to Rebecca. The, the country uh, is gearing up to this uh, uh, transition. That's one thing that we know for certain, at least has been promised. Um, Fukuang has actually uh, uh, speculated, I guess, because it's not official that the uh, transition would happen um, sometime between the budget statement and the National Day rally speech. Um, uh, so uh, that's an, uh, you know, an interesting guess. Um, my question to you, Rebecca, is that since our uh, prime ministerial system doesn't actually let voters uh, pick the head of government directly, mm -hmm. Uh, the ruling party obviously needs other ways to establish a, a strong bond uh, between the public and the um, uh, its next leader, Lawrence Wong, as well as the rest of the 4G team. Uh, and, and it seems as if the forward Singapore process uh, is intended to achieve that. What's your take uh, on that process? And do you think uh, it places the PAP in a good position for the next uh, general election? So um, let's, I guess, talk about slightly less... Uh... I suppose the more boring part of, of politics, I suppose, sort of the policy documents that come out, right? Um, and most recently, sort of the forward as she uh, engagement exercise. Um, and and I think that it's it's interesting because we often think of these large scale public consultation uh engagement um uh, um exercises. Um, this is probably about I think the sixth uh large scale one, and we always want to see this as part of. Uh, always occurring at um, sort of what's seen as pivotal moments uh, in the sort of uh, Singapore politics, right? So leadership change. Uh, so we saw that with um, Go Chok Tong and he became prime minister. Uh, we also saw that uh, with uh, the shift, uh, obviously, with the new millennium coming, uh, as well as um, the original idea of, of Heng Sui Kiet uh, taking over the last uh, uh, large scale uh, consultation exercise, uh, which was uh, SG, SG Together. Um, and so the most recent one, uh, Forward Singapore, should be seen within that context, right? So the, where these consultation exercises uh, take place sort of at pivotal moments, especially with leadership change uh, within the ruling party. Um, and so I think that there are a couple of ways of seeing Forward SG as part of kind of the way we've um, public engagement exercises have been carried out um, by the government. Uh, the first is it's it's public engagement uh, is always presented as kind of first and foremost getting a pulse on what uh, the value systems are uh, of uh, the Singapore of the Singaporean electorate and uh, Singaporean public in general, right? So you know about large scale. So I think forward as she was two hundred thousand Singaporeans were consulted in various uh, forms uh, over over the course of the exercise, um, and so it's first to just get a sense of what. Singapore to think about, right? Uh, what values and what the what kind of Singapore do they want? Um, so for example, in Forward SG, uh, there was a talk about moving away from the five C's of materialism uh, to perhaps what some people presented as a sort of most more post-material uh, set of values, uh, ideas of inclusivity, uh, ideas of fairness. Um, and so the, the report does make a lot of mention of this, uh, including people with disabilities, uh, talking about questions of fairness uh, and uh, social mobility. Um, and so the, 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 the report is quite, uh, I suppose, summarizes some of these value shifts. Um, and so I think uh, in terms of talking a little bit about what this re reflects about leadership uh, within the PAP, um, I suppose the first thing we would probably say is just simply that the idea of holding this sort of big consultation exercise while at the same time bringing in new leadership is to really demonstrate first and foremost the 
this effort that I think a lot of our prime ministers have been trying to do uh, repeatedly is to present themselves as firstly consultative, right? To have their ear to the ground, uh, to know the value systems. Now, obviously, different people have asked, you know, how significant is this? Is this just, just sort of gesturing rather than any meaningful change? Um, we won't know this, of course, until we actually see uh, what policy outcomes come uh, to the fore. Um, so that's the first thing. I think it's just to present the new leadership as uh, wanting to find out what's on the ground, wanting to uh, engage with that. That being said, the policy exercises or these engagement exercises have also been very clearly not meant to be um, always sort of uh, entirely responsive uh, in the sense that they want to gather the information and gather a sense of what's on the ground, but not necessarily promising large scale change. So it's not meant to be, you know, we are going to be sort of reactionary towards public opinion. Um, so I think Heng Sui Kiet in the 2012 one, uh, which is our Singapore for conversation, basically talked about how uh, public engagement exercises is not about culling sacred cows, right? That was his term. We're not changing policy direction hugely. Uh, and so we see a similar thing with Forward Singapore, which demonstrates, I think, the way the political leadership is going, which is they want to be consultative, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to see huge changes just because Singaporeans want this. So they're mentioned in the in the report about, you know, there while there may be different opinions, um, people need to accept that certain sometimes decisions will be made and they're not always happy with. And this is something that Lawrence Wong himself said when he uh was doing the lead the announcement about the leadership transition, right? He said, you know, we are not, uh sometimes we have to accept. Uh, and he will have to take responsibility for decisions uh, that he will make. Uh, and so there was that kind of narrative as well that while we want feedback and there will be feedback, um, it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to see wholesale, wholesale change, very significant change. Um, and I think what this is interesting, where we have, I think we have seen some changes, obviously significant changes in the past couple of years in terms of policy direction. Uh, so for example, the rise of uh, the creation of the uh, progressive wage model, um, um, other things like, for example, uh, shifting our education system significantly. But what's interesting is what we're seeing, what we saw with the, those shifts, those what, what are fairly significant shifts, uh, occurring under Lee Sin Long's government, right? So as an established leader of the party, established prime minister with a good track record, uh, significant changes are occurring under a very, already established uh, leader. And so um, what we're seeing forward as she's a continuation of those significant changes um but not a sh not a break um so it's con it's continuity of of significant changes uh which are seen to be in line with singapore singaporean values right of inclusivity and so forth um and i think then what we can also think about as well is that when we see upcoming policy changes um before and after the elections um whether it's things like for example the expand there's talk a little bit about the expansion of the Aggressive wage model, for example, in uh, Forward SG, as well as uh, continued, for example, uh, uh, subsidies for welfare, uh, in terms of subsidies for childcare and uh, uh, unemployment. Um, in this case, then the, the Forward SG exercise is also significant because it basically tells us um, that even if there's some unhappiness because this is a reflection of, this is a responsiveness to people's values, right? It's what those people want. So it's framed all these policy uh, suggestions and policy proposals effectively are framed as being responsive to Singaporean values, right? And then what happens basically is that apart from just demonstrating that the leadership is in line or being consultative, if there is unhappiness in some quarters about some of the public policies, some of the policy changes, like for example, restrictions on immigration, which has raised uh, certain complaints among, say, businesses, right, who say, you know, we should not be uh, making more restrictions on, say, the employment pass uh, system. Um, then what the forward SG exercise uh, also does is it's something that the ruling party can point to and say, you know, this is not something that we are imposing from the top. Uh, this is something that all Singaporeans want because we engaged in this huge exercise uh, and these are the values that Singaporeans are, are communicating. These are the things that are important to them. So it's no longer just a top-down decision, right? So it's this framing or consultation. It is also a policy decision that is in line with Singaporean values. So, um, and so that's when we kind of see that the forward uh exercise is not merely kind of an act of simply uh, saying, you know, we're just going to respond to everything that comes in. Uh, they're still reserving the right to obviously um, uh, make policy in a way that they that is deemed best, um, but also allows a significant degree of signaling about the engagement, the willingness to listen. 
uh, what this translates to, obviously, uh, in real in, in sort of real time policy, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Um, but I think that that broadly sort of understanding the way forward SG is kind of a continuation of previous engagement exercises, um, but also the uh, that it's just going to continue uh, and strengthen uh, already ch uh, changes that already occurred before the forward SG uh, uh, um, uh, uh, engagement exercise was carried out, right? To continue things like the progressive wage model, uh, restrictions a little bit on immigration and so forth, while at the same time maintaining an open economy. So we'll see some degree of, there's a lot of continuity in many ways uh, that continue the big changes that we saw under Lee Sin Long uh, in the past uh, couple of years. Thanks, Rebecca. So, of course, the, the PAP doesn't have an open goal. It, it doesn't uh, completely have uh, set the terms of the uh, the debate because it has to deal with the minor inconvenience of opposition parties wanting a say too, right? <laughs> and, of course, and, and it is all going to happen uh, in the next, uh, what, one to one and a half years. Uh, we're going to see these different uh, visions, these different claims of uh, being the true representative of Singapore values uh, actually being put to voters. And so I want to ask uh, Elvin uh, next, um, how do you think uh, the main parties are set up uh, for the election that uh, uh, will happen, I guess, in 12, uh, 12 to 18 months? Um, uh, what does what we've seen in 2023 tell us about uh, the coming months? Hi, uh, thank you everyone for being here and thank you for having me. Uh, just a small caveat before I begin my remarks, uh, it is very early in the morning here in New York City, it's at 7.30 a.m. So my mind may be still a bit garbled. Uh, so please forgive me if I speak too slowly, if I bore you or if I'm, not, uh, if I'm too incoherent. Uh, so uh, thank you all for your patience. Um, so to answer uh, Chairman's question about how the opposition parties have fared uh, so far in 2023 and how they are set up, uh, maybe let me proceed uh, chronologically, order by order, uh, party by party in terms of uh, the perceptions right, of uh, the, the so-called bigness uh, of uh, different uh, parties from the Workers' Party down to the SDP, the Progress Singapore Party, and then the other smaller uh, opposition parties. Uh, let me also just say that I have no particular uh, unique insights and insider information to all these opposition parties. Uh, one of the uh, pastimes that I have is uh, scrolling social media uh, to see what uh, the various political parties are up to. So I subscribe to you know the PAP's Telegram channel. I subscribe to the PAP's uh, Instagram page, uh, as well as the Workers' Party, the Progressing Upper Party, and all the different uh, politicians uh, to see what they are trying to signal right to us uh, ordinary Singaporeans. Uh, so so my main insights are from there. So let me proceed. Uh, piece by piece uh, from, uh, sorry, party by party from uh, the Workers' Party. So I think for the Workers' Party, as many people have known, uh, known right by now, uh, is that it has uh, weakened somewhat significantly with the loss of uh, three political leaders, right? So the first one is Raiza Khan, the second one is Nicosia, and the third one is Leon Pereira. And previously they had 10 members of parliament, uh, and now they are down to eight uh, members of parliament. So I think uh, one of their main concerns uh, would be to recruit good candidates uh, for uh, their um, party so that they can replenish the ranks uh, approaching the next general elections, right? Uh, and also to provide some new fresh blood uh, so that they may uh, think about their own leadership succession uh, uh, over the next few years. Uh, and of course, on that uh, recruiting good candidate front, we have seen uh, a particular senior counsel uh, lawyer. Um, Mr. If I'm not wrong, his name is uh, Mr. Hapreet Singh Nehal, uh, who has been on walkabouts uh, with the Workers' Party, uh, in the Workers' Party t-shirt. Right? Uh, and of course, I've also seen uh, many grassroots uh, of the Workers' Party who are also still doing their outreach on a weekly basis at Marine Parade, uh, at Aljunin, um, in Sengkang. 
So I think in general, there's a sense for the Workers' Party, there's a sense of patience. There's a sense of trying to grow slowly to try to recruit uh, more good candidates. Now, on this uh, point about good candidates, I just want to add an additional thing. I was having this very interesting conversation with a political scientist here at Yale University who has actually done some uh, research on Singapore, uh, not published yet, uh, but he was just sharing his uh, uh, results with me. And he found that you know, the number one thing that actually motivates Singaporeans to vote for a particular party or candidate is perceptions of competency. Right. So if you are a you if you come across as a really competent candidate because of your profession or because of whatever your background, then you're more likely to attract people uh, to vote for you. Um, and the PAP has got that in bucket loads, right? For the longest time since independence, uh, the PAP has uh, portrayed itself as a really competent party with really competent candidates. Uh, so that's why we are all shocked. Right, when some of its candidates may be less than competent when they are presented uh, in the general elections. And I think the, for the opposition parties, uh, the, the same goes as well. So the, the, one of the main priorities should be to recruit uh, good, uh, competent candidates. Um, the second opposition party that we'll talk about is the Progress Singapore Party. Uh, they have the two uh, NCMPs in Mr. Liang Wang Wai and Ms. Hazel Pua. Um, and I think one of the main things that we have seen this past year is that the both of them have really learned how to work parliament. Right? By working parliament, I mean to use the rules and the stage of parliament to try to... Uh, showcase their own characters, to try to showcase their party's ideology, um, both in terms of trying to set the agenda with some adjournment motions, um, but also trying to uh, differentiate themselves quite heavily with uh, the People's Action Party by asking their parliamentary questions, as well as uh, asking for clarification questions wherever there are uh, um, ministerial statements, right? So I think... Um, them, the two of them being in parliament is a good thing because uh, parliament has a lot of different uh, rules and regulations which ordinary Singaporeans are not familiar with, even I am not familiar with. Uh, and I think they are there uh, actually for these past few years, they have actually gained working experience uh, to be in parliament. So if eventually, maybe in the future, they get into parliament, uh, it will uh, be good for the Progress Singapore Party uh, that uh, they have some people who are already familiar with how parliament works and therefore can uh, hit the ground running. For the SDP, um, the main thing I've seen uh, so far on their social media channels is that they have uh, opened a new office recently. Uh, I think uh, usually a political party having an office uh, is important uh, for them to have a, a logistical and administrative uh, headquarters uh, to, to do their logistical out. Um, uh, prep work, right, for uh, outreach uh, to ordinary Singaporeans. Um, and I also saw that in late uh, November, just last month, that uh, the um, that they had posted a couple of photos on Facebook to show that they held an open house uh, for this new office and they uh, invited all the opposition party leaders uh, to join them. And there were a lot of opposition party leaders uh, in that uh, in that room. Uh, and I was surprised that, uh, so for the longest time, um, the Workers' Party has tend to have a kind of a, a little bit ambivalent relationship with the other opposition uh, parties, but uh, included in that meeting uh, was uh, Mr. Dennis Tan as well. Uh, so I think it's a good sign that all of them are talking with each other uh, and seeing how uh, they can potentially work together. For the rest of the other opposition parties, uh, smaller opposition parties that, that might not come so readily to mind, I think I can count uh, about eight of them. Uh, and when I was doing some Googling background research uh, for uh, uh, this talk, um, it, it came as a surprise to me that, uh, well, not really a surprise, but uh, these smaller opposition parties are actually trying to form coalitions in order to contest in the next general election. 
Uh, and there are actually two coalitions in the work. Uh, one is a coalition called the People's Alliance. Uh, this includes the People's Voice, the Reform Party, the uh, People's Power Party, and the Democratic Progressive Party. Um, so this is more of a formal alliance where they have actually submitted their registration with the Registrar of Societies, and they say that they've contest under the banner, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, there's another second, more informal coalition, which doesn't really have a name, uh, but this informal coalition is led by uh, NSP, the National, I think it's the National Solidarity Party, the Red Dot United RDU, SPP, Singapore People's Party, and as well as uh, Singapore United Party, um, SUP. And so I think all this alliance formation is really trying to aggregate resources, uh, aggregate um, to make sure that people don't fight with each other, they collaborate with each other. I think ultimately, uh, what will convince Singaporeans or not is whether they will uh, be able to recruit good candidates uh, and to uh, show that they, their candidates are as competent, if not more competent, uh, than the candidates that the People's Action Party put out. We already know that they are uh, very different from the PAP in terms of policies, and that is not really a surprise to us. But if the opposition parties can put up really competent candidates, uh, which surprise voters, uh, then that may uh, have more traction for them in the future. And that's all I have. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, next, Ian, um, you know, we don't normally think of uh, international affairs uh, sort of animating domestic political debates, but the last couple of years have been different in that sense. Uh, US-China frictions, the war in Ukraine, and now, of course, the war in Gaza have been co very contentious issues locally. And I want to ask you what you think of how the uh, government has been trying to manage local sentiments around these uh, uh, global issues. So I would say that in the past, uh, perhaps uh, Singapore domestically has been more insulated from uh, global affairs, but that is going to be decreasingly the case. Um, and Singapore, for all the insulation, cannot separate itself. It, we're a small country, we're highly dependent uh, on being able to be connected to the world, uh, whether this is in terms of uh, capital and finance or trade or skills, um, all flows of people. Um, so in that uh, respect, right, um, the fact that people in Singapore are so connected to the outside world, they are starting to realize that, um, say, the conflict in Ukraine um, affects things like food prices, oil prices, uh, potentially the uh, Israel-Hamas conflict as well. Uh, if it spreads uh, throughout the Middle East, where it seems to be threatening to do, um, then... Uh, of course, closer to home, there is the there is the uh, civil war in Myanmar, where we see uh, people of uh, Myanmar descent or, or Myanmar nationals working in Singapore, you know, really uh, highly mobilized around those issues. So um, on, I think that is also a lot of this contentiousness reflects the fact that um, the world that we used to live in, the world that we were more familiar with, um, you know, and the the first the Cold War, then the sort of post Cold War world where things were a lot more predictable, um, where at least in the richer parts of the world, which uh, Singapore belongs to, um, there's a there was a certain sort of expectation that things will go along, um, but that's no longer the case. Right, we ha we have the two largest economies in the world. Um, one looking at internal circulation, that's the PRC, the People's Republic of China, and then you have the uh, United States uh, and its allies and friends who are looking at onshoring and friendshoring, meaning to say that they're not as interested uh, um, as they were before uh, in terms of uh, integrating with each other. They are not um, as interested uh, as before uh, in liberalizing their economies. So you have the contentiousness, the sort of conflicts that we see, you see the major powers not working together anymore. So what does that mean for Singapore? It means that we have a far more complicated environment in which to navigate. Um, there has, in really since the end of the Cold War, this sort of claim about uh, Singapore not having to choose sides, there's a certain intuitive appeal to that. However, um, that kind of uh, position is possible if there's enough space 
uh, between the major powers, the major actors, for a variety of uh, behavior and policies. That's going to be decreasingly the case um, as the uh, United States and the PRC, uh, for instance, seek to um, gain advantage over each other. So, you know, the sort of more relaxed approach that we had in Singapore, um, you know, that may have to go away. I mean, in, in, in some sense, this is quite understandable. If you think about the whole, the way that the Singapore economy works, we have historically gotten capital and technology uh, from places like um, the, the US, from Japan, from Europe, they still um, um, they still account for the bulk of Singapore's FDI, the bulk of Singapore's trade and services, and then we manufacture stuff that we sell to places like the PRC, or we you know have components we buy from the PRC that we then manufacture and sell elsewhere. So the trade in goods, um, you know, it's largest with ASEAN, but then secondarily um, with, with the PRC. So we're part of that ecosystem, and now we're seeing that ecosystem sort of pull apart um, and it's not entirely clear where we're going, which gets us back to, gets me back at least to what we were talking about earlier. I mean, uh, in terms of leadership transition, I personally, um, you know, am very curious as to um, where uh, Lawrence Wong wants to lead Singapore. Yes, he is going to be the leader, but where does he want to go? How do we get there? What do we have to um, do uh, what costs do we have to pay in order to get to that vision? Those are things that I'm looking out for, but have not uh, really seen. Let me just end there for now. Thank you. Um, yeah, again, you raised a couple of points that I think deserve to be uh, developed. The uh, challenges that the next leadership will face precisely on the international front, uh, but also back uh, to, of course, one of the uh, central questions uh, for politics, which, which is the uh, economy. And I want to, at this stage, uh, maybe throw up a couple of questions that came earlier from uh, members of the audience. Uh, the first is this, uh, should the cost of living be debated and discussed uh, more um, in parliament and the media? Why isn't it so currently? Uh, a related question, uh, will the government do more to slow cost increases rather than just handouts and uh, rebates? Um, well, this isn't, uh, you know, a session on the economy, but uh, tell us, perhaps, Fukuang and uh, maybe Ian, um, oh, how big uh, is this uh, concern about cost and how will it uh, affect, say, the next elections? Um, uh, your... Fukuang, do you want to go first? Yeah, Fukuang, yeah. Sure. Uh, okay, sorry, I was muted. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, yeah, I, I think cost of living will be the, it, it, one of the major issues, if not the, the, the most uh, pressing issue uh, for the parties uh, to, you know, to, to debate over. Uh, I think there was a motion, right, uh, put out by the Workers' Party on, on, on the cost of living, but, uh, you know, with parliamentary debate, you, you, you're not quite sure uh, you know what what sort of impact it really has on 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 the ground. Uh, so there, there was a I I kind of it, it must have got, gotten on for about two or three hours. Uh, I don't think very many people uh, remember very much of what, what was being said because uh, there were no new sort of initiatives or, or, or announcements. You know, it's very interesting to to hear that the, the second question that you pose, whether the government will do anything to slow down cost increases uh, instead of just giving uh, handouts and subsidies. Uh, my actual answer to that is, uh, in fact, I don't think I don't think uh, so at all because uh, it has raised the GST, so that's obviously going to raise the cost of living. Uh, taxi fares are, are going to go up, which has been announced. Uh, detail for bus fares and, and MRT fares. Uh, electricity prices are, are set, to, set to go up as well. Uh, you know, housing prices are, uh, have been rising for a few years now. Uh, so if anything, uh, the government uh, to, 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 to address these cost issues is going to give even more handouts and, and, and subsidies. Uh, uh, maybe it's to do with 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 Singapore's place in 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 the world economy. You know, it, it's it's very hard for 
for for for a Singapore government to uh, shield the population from from these cost increases because you know it's a uh, it's a global thing. Inflation is 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 a global problem. Uh, so I don't see the PAP government doing very much to slow down cost increases. Uh, in fact, as, as I just mentioned just now, they have allowed many of these cost increases to flow into the in, to flow into the economy, and they will continue to rely on what they believe is the, is the right approach, which is to give more subsidies and handouts to uh, the lower income group. Uh, and, and to in, in a way shield them from 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 the cost increases, but uh, uh, I think it will be a political problem uh, in 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 the next uh, GE, uh, and it will be interesting to see how the especially how the opposition parties uh, uh, take on the, the the government in in this respect. And I, I, I suppose the Workers Party. In introducing that motion in Parliament, was in a way sort of uh, sounding out the first sort of battle cry. You know, I think they are preparing to engage the government precisely on, on this particular issue come the next uh, uh, general election. Actually, before I turn to Ian, I, can I just uh, flip it to to Alvin because since. Uh, Opposition is your territory. Uh, the uh, one dilemma that I find that the PP is in uh, is that it still hasn't really figured out how to respond uh, to the opposition, particularly in Parliament. Right? I mean, on the one hand, um, it could probably show itself to be uh, reasonable, uh, responsive, uh, if it found some kind of middle ground and accommodation. Uh, with um, uh, concerns that the opposition raises, that it knows are in fact reflecting <clears throat> concerns. Uh, yet at the same time, of course, it uh, I, I think it fears that doing so, you know, finding a middle ground will actually make the opposition seem too reasonable and will actually uh, reduce the distance, the perceived distance between uh, opposition and the PAP. And of course, Every party uh, by nature wants, in fact, to uh, maximize the perceived distance between them and their, uh, and their uh, opponents. Um, uh, how do you uh, see that dynamic play out in this particular issue of uh, cost of living and equality and so on? Uh, perhaps starting with this uh, debate in Parliament, what, what did you make of that? So, uh, with regards to this issue about cost of living and inflation, I, I agree with everyone that it's, it's a huge issue. Um, I think at the latest uh, um, uh, monetary policy statement put out by MAS, the core inflation for this year is going to come in at around 4% or maybe a bit lower than that. And uh, But 4% historically for us for core inflation is really high. It's it's actually more than the uh, 3.5% interest rate we get on CPF ordinary account. And so basically our CPFs are eroding uh, in value over time. So I agree that this is, this is a really important issue. Uh, with regards to the Workers' Party performance in Parliament, I think uh, both the Workers' Party as well as the Progress Singapore Party, it is natural uh, for them to try to push the government as much as possible with uh, the adjournment motions, with clarification questions, and push them on uh, the um, different uh, 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 issues, particularly on cost of uh, living. I think parliament has been an arena for the Workers' Party to air its policy recommendations, right? And to air its policy uh, differences. So I believe, you know, the Workers' Party has made various suggestions about how uh, the government should potentially nationalize public transport even further to rein in uh, costs, to control costs for Singaporeans. Uh, for example, to try to, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, change the way uh, water consumption uh, is calculated and the cost of water consumption is calculated. Uh, as another way of trying to control the cost of inflation. So I think Parliament as arena for Workers' Party to broadcast its own particular policy recommendations, I think that's uh, a good thing. For the PAP's response, 
I think, uh, as you mentioned, they are kind of caught in uh, uh, to to in the dilemma, right? If they agree with the Workers' Party too much, then it seems that they are too conciliatory. If they uh, disagree with the Workers' Party too much, then it seems that they are too stubborn. I think there's no good uh, response from the PAP that will satisfy everyone. I think the the best kind of response that they have done so far, uh, which we have seen so far, is that they say we agree that it's a problem and there's an important problem, and we, but we believe that our policy recommendations uh, are superior to yours, right? Uh, and because we have the civil service behind us, our civil service are working very hard as well to try to uh, think about the various policy recommendations to try to reduce the cost of uh, living for everyone. So I think that is kind of the best response that actually the PAP can get, give. Um, I struggle to think of a better response which uh, the PAP uh, might provide that will satisfy uh, its own base. So. Um, I think everyone is doing fairly decently right now, as so far as like uh, parliamentary debate goes. They're doing what they need to do, but uh, well, that's the best response they can give, uh, given that they're not actually going to change policies fundamentally. Which I think uh, reminds me of what Rebecca said uh, earlier that uh, you know the the uh, plan seems to be to you know a certain gradualism. We're not going to slaughter. Uh, too many sacred cows and so on. And so is this, uh, Rebecca, one of those issues where we're seeing the limits of that kind of gradualism? What do you think? I think, so certainly I think we've seen that the, the PAP's kind of held on to the fame of saying we want to continue to maintain an open economy, right? And inflation uh, is a almost necessary consequence of when the open economy is, is the narrative that the PAP is doing, giving, right? Which is why the handouts are the only response because if you say, you know, we we are a small economy, we have no choice but to be open, then there's not really an alternative response, right? Because um, you either close your economy, which is what some, some, some countries are doing to kind of deal with the question of inflation, right? Um, or you end up giving out more subsidies. And the other thing that I think needs to be added as well um, to, to kind of the discussion about policy responses is um, that the gradualism is a very slow um, process of shifting. So there is openness to the economy um, and there is that in some ways a, a sacred cow, right? We're not going to close up our economy. Um, but a shift towards an alternative form of, of an open economy um, that we're starting to see where we're saying, you know, we are an open economy, but maybe we're going to be less open regarding, uh, less reliant, for example, on foreign labor. So we're seeing that very slow gradualism of, of kind of uh, um, not being so heavily reliant on, on foreign labor. Uh, we're also seeing a shift towards saying things like, you know, in order to adapt to a changing economy, uh, people have got to upskill. So that's the other response actually to rising inflation is not just simply that we're going to give out handouts, which is kind of the stopgap measure, but that individuals, uh, Singaporeans need to adapt so that they can cope with rising inflation, meaning they need to reskill, upskill so that they can earn more money uh, and cope with these higher costs of living. Um, and so that's the alternative response. When we have seen what the opposition has done in response, uh, you do see some... Um, challenges um, to some of these ideas of openness. No, not challenging openness itself, but challenging our understanding of openness. So I think Jameis Lim uh, proposed uh, that we don't think so much uh, in, in purely sort of free trade frameworks when we think about openness. Uh, and he proposed um, that when we think about openness, we're thinking about sort of data sh uh, sharing of information, uh, up just generally ensuring that our, our workforce itself is just more open to adapting uh, to the global economy rather than just saying we're going to bring in uh, 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 foreign labor, we're going to bring in foreign expertise and foreign direct investment. Um, and so there's that, but it's still not, nobody's kind of culling the secret cow, right? Everybody's saying we still know openness, but maybe we want to change our way in which we think about openness, right? So we're thinking about, uh, you know, openness to a different form, right? Right? openness to more knowledge, openness to picking up different skills. Um, so while we might be, uh, so this allows some flexibility in terms of changing our conception of saying, you know, we're not, maybe not going to be so open uh, towards migration um, uh, or uh, to, for example, uh, you know, so that's when we see that shift. But we're still going to say we're still open, but we're not, we're just changing our, our meaning behind openness. And so I think that's where we're seeing that gradualism uh, to not kind of, 
outright say we're going to close our economy because I mean that's also question feasibility is, is just not something that's likely or feasible to really happen uh, but thinking a little bit more of, you know we want to try and upskill workers everybody kind of we externalize it to to workers right so the PAP doesn't have to kind of in the long term do more drastic change uh, they're instead saying you know workers you gain the skills so you can cope with inflation right um, that's what really the upskilling uh, system is really about right to say you know earn more money get higher higher skilled jobs higher paying jobs to cope with the rising cost of living yeah okay uh, um, sorry can i can, can i can i jump in uh, 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 sure yeah please do yeah yeah i think i think this particular area is going to be a a, a big challenge for the four, for the new 4g leadership <clears throat> being led by uh, Lawrence Wong. uh so I, I i agree with rebecca that uh, we are not going to see very fundamental changes uh, by by Lawrence Wong. I mean, uh, people don't change at that age, I think. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, but I, on the other hand, I think he needs to uh, um, demonstrate a, a stronger imprint, you know, in, in, in his leadership and, uh, and set himself up as uh, the the leader in this new era, right? That he's he's going to bring Singapore into. Uh, obviously, Ford Singapore is uh, his platform for doing so. Uh, but you know, the the problem with that is that uh, you know, if you ask people uh, about their impressions of of Ford Singapore, I know there are many ideas, and it's been a long process and all that. But there there isn't one really very striking uh, proposal or, or suggestion that, that sets uh, him, you know, apart from, uh, from, from the old leadership and, and he can say, this is what I, I, I stand for. And I think he needs that, you know, to, to uh, bring uh, the people around to, to his new leadership, you know, and especially uh, going forward in, 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 into the GE. Uh, and I think this question about uh, the market, the open economy, how you want to uh, position Singapore uh, uh, in, in that respect is is one is is a major area, uh, and and there there are areas in which uh, I I feel the government has to step in more decisively uh, uh, to, uh, to 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 manage uh, price increases, and we have seen. Examples of where the free market has completely gone uh, 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 wow. You know, in, uh, you know, we we created a, a, an open market for electricity, right? Uh, we invited uh, com uh, foreign com uh, companies in to bid for you know for uh, for the right to supply electricity. It's now me. It's now facing severe problems, and the government has had just very recently. Decided to step in to uh, to make its own investment in in okay. In, so um, I'm sorry. Okay. Actually, can I can I come in here for a moment, please? Okay, um, I, I kind I, uh, Ian, before you do uh, because I kind of know I can tell from the the you know I, I've seen that expression many times. You <laughs> and and I want to uh, before you uh, 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 intervene. I want to throw in a question from the audience because I think you will have an answer to it. Uh, so just to give the audience more space. And this is a challenge from Kevin Tan, uh, Professor Kevin Tan, our good friend, uh, who I think you will have a good answer for. Uh, and Kevin Tan says, Dear Speaker, so far you all appear to be responding to what is happening and how the PAP and other parties are responding. But can you offer us your views on what the right path should be in respect of these various developments? What policies are right for Singapore? in respect of costs, housing, etc. And I, I guess I would throw in uh, with respect to inequality as well. And why aren't the politicians doing anything about it? My sense, my gut feel is that that's where you want to go. Uh, Ian? Well, yeah, you, you know you know me well, sir. And that is a uh, sort of direction where I want to go. Um, but uh, how I want to approach it is to say this. Uh, a lot of the discussion centers around openness, non-openness. I think that's the wrong discussion to have. Um, I think if you look at various models that are out there, it's not about openness or non-openness. It's about redistribution. So this gets to the inequality question. Um, you can 
there are fairly successful economies that are that are more redistributive. So, uh, you know, think about Northern European. I don't know why we have this very um U.S. centered sort of view of you know liberalism. It's not even Canadian. Canadians are far more redistributive than 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 uh, than Americans. Um, so I think the point about to get to inequality and re rebates and so on is this: if we believe that um, cost increases, inflation is temporary, then things like rebates, um, write-offs, um, vouchers, they may work, right? Because they're they're ad hoc. Just stop that. If it is the case that um, inequality is going to be more persistent, not really, not necessarily because of what we do domestically, but just because of the way uh, that Singapore's comparative advantage works, um, then perhaps there needs to be some thinking about how we want to make the system uh, more redistributive uh, institutionally. Right, so that may mean um higher taxes on uh some individuals who earn more, uh some companies who earn more. That's not okay. And I know in many Singaporeans' minds is this: oh, you either like hundred percent tax or you do no tax. It's not that you you can increase by a few percentage points that um that can be then pulled to uh to redistribute. So that those are things that need to be on the table rather than this openness non openness discussion. Um, and I think in particular. As I mentioned earlier, we're heading into a world that is going to be um, a lot more tumultuous. Uh, this sort of rethinking may be what is necessary. And it's not, it goes beyond partisan politics. Um, I think if you look at places where populism, uh, where sort of nastier politics uh, on the sort of extreme right and left wing, uh, extreme right and left come about, it's where people feel left out. It's where people feel that they don't have a stake or whatever they do, they can't affect change to make their lives better in a political system. So if we are in a world that, you know, to no fault of our own, um, is structurally uh, set up such that there will be uh, a lot of far richer people and a lot of people who are less rich, uh, then we may need to rethink the way that we approach things. And the thing with the market, which everybody likes to talk about, is the fact that there is market failure. Right, uh, and we need to address market failure. Um, and this often uh, has to do with public goods. But um, as uh, James Lim had talked about earlier, um, also the market works on information. And sometimes when you don't have sufficient information, there's also going to be market failure. And we need to be realistic um, about you know when you know markets work and when they might not work. Right, and it's and this is where sometimes you know. Uh, we talk a lot about pragmatism in Singapore, um, but it seems to be wrapped up in this neoliberal ideology without being re really thinking about okay, how do we make things work for Singapore and Singaporeans in the long in the longer run. I mean, this what I'm talking about may be what's necessary for this moment in time. Uh, so at some later point, that it needs to be rethought. But I think we are a bit lacking in this sort of larger imagination and we wrap ourselves up on the sort of things about well openness non-openness um you know whether there is uh you know some some marketization here you know, non-marketization there um but i think these bigger debates are probably what's necessary going forward okay great this i just want to take another comment from uh the audience um uh, manu sabnani our uh, former colleague uh, Fuquang, um says uh, Forward Singapore actually has a number of good ideas and policy adjustments. It offers possible solutions for a number of current problems. So it's not right to say Lawrence Wong has not shown his leadership hand uh, clearly. So I guess it's a half empty, half full kind of debate. But I, I would like to just uh, use that opportunity to maybe voice my own opinion that perhaps uh, it would be um, inappropriate or uh, you know to 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 actually judge Lawrence Wong's potential based on Forward Singapore since obviously he's not prime minister yet uh, and uh, clearly Forward Singapore is more of a consensus document with his the rest of his cabinet uh, so it is still possible you know, even if as uh, I think Rebecca uh, pointed out at the start uh, there's nothing traumatic uh, in the um, in that document, uh, it does not preclude the possibility uh, that this is a prime minister that will rise to the challenge and do something, if not revolutionary, at least uh, you know represent some kind of quantum leap in terms of um, uh, the policies that he 
uh, implements early in his prime ministership, which of course has not actually uh, started. The I, I want to uh, return to this question that um, uh, Ian brought up, or the point that Ian brought up, that uh, the, the way that we discuss many of these issues, uh, perhaps, um, you know, it, it, it tends to be, uh, the, the Singapore debates tend to oversimplify the choices. Uh, and of course, it is a classic way to um, uh, to avoid deeper debates, you know, to kind of put things in binary uh, choices, right? So instead of having a proper debate about the level of taxation, uh, let's imagine that the debate is about no taxation or 100% check taxation, whatever it isn't. I mean, there obviously are ways in which we can uh, find the happy medium. And, and this leads me, uh, perhaps in a rather tortured way, uh, to the role of institutions that that manage this debate, that are the spaces for uh, these kinds of discussion. And I want to use the opportunity, since we do have, um, you know, former editor of the Straits Times uh, here, uh, my former boss, as I should, <laughs> I should, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, declare my interest here. The uh, what? What do you make of the um, the environment for these kinds of policy debate right now? And I ask because uh, I think. Uh, many of us do notice that, um, at the very least, uh, you know, SD has not the Straits Times in particular, uh, the press in general. Um, the the situation has not panned out the way that we back in say the nineteen nineties or the early two thousands expected. I think if we if you asked any journalist then, we would take it for granted that uh, along with the rest of Singapore. Uh, the press would be can, could only improve. It would become more diverse, more reflective of uh, the the debates out there. Um, so it is a, a surprise and a disappointment to see that uh, by I think a strong consensus it hasn't improved. And in fact, many would say that um, the space uh, for debate within the mainstream media has actually shrunk. Uh, do you share that observation, and uh, what, what do you make of this paradox? Uh, your audio again. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I think it is a it is it is a problem. Uh, one of our well, we both of us know him, Derwin Pereira, ex journalist of the Straits Times. Uh, he had a Facebook post which went, I suppose, uh, viral, and I. I Somebody sent it to me. Uh, he was talking about precisely this point, uh, lamenting the lack of uh, quality opinion pieces in the Straits Times uh, compared to uh, earlier earlier years. Uh, I agree with him, and and I think the problem it's not just the opinion pieces. I I would I would say the the problem with the news stories are even more acute. Uh, uh, just, just to cite one example, last month there was a story that the Straits Times published on the front page. This was from a speech by a minister on this new law that's going to be introduced to regulate investments in infrastructural projects that are considered critical for Singapore security. The story is totally unreadable. I mean, I, I, I read it. I, I, I couldn't understand uh, uh, what, what was written. Uh, Perhaps the minister didn't go into as much details of, of the plan, uh, but <clears throat> but as a newspaper, you have to make the story uh, readable. But you know this one was uh, almost gibberish. So when I read it, I thought, oh yeah, the, the problem is mu is much deeper than than I thought, uh, and uh, uh, it 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 does seem to me that nobody can you know about the quality of of the stories being put out in the paper. I mean, if anybody cared, that story wouldn't have been published. Uh, I think the problem with the Straits Times is that it has lost too many people, good journalists over the last 10 years, uh, who have not been replaced. Uh, you know, quality journalism depends on the quality of the newsroom. Uh, it's, 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 it's not rocket science. Uh, uh, to be fair to the, to, to the paper, I mean, uh, Almost every paper in the world has been facing severe challenges, right, over the last 10, 15 years as a result of the digital revolution, loss of advertising revenue, 
uh, loss of readership because there's no alternative media and so on and so forth. Uh, but that's, you know, the government has in a way solved that problem by publicly funding the Straits Times, uh, creating this uh, trust. It has solved the money problem, but I'm afraid uh, it hasn't solved the, the, the quality problem. Uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, this is a ex-journalist uh, rent, renting away at, uh, at, at, at a problem, but, uh, but yeah, I share the concerns of, of people who, 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 who are deeply unsettled by, uh, by uh, what's been happening in the, in, in the paper. Nola, the Straits Times can uh, have great success as uh, something like the People's Daily, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I think what's the, uh, these are uh, some of uh, what you've heard, I guess, are matters of opinion, but what is, I think, an uh, objective fact uh, is that for the first time in history, uh, Singapore will move to an election uh, with no daily newspapers that are not funded by the government. Um, don't know. There's no. There's uh, zero uh, daily reporting capacity that is um, funded from non-government sources, except of course for small uh, blogs, which are more opinion-led rather than reporting. This is very, very new. Uh, where all our newsrooms are essentially can I, funded. Can I? Can I just chime in here because I think there's not. It's not necessarily. A problem um, if we have state-funded uh, media, right? Um, the BBC is, you know, is, is a state-backed media. NHK is public-funded. Yes, it, they're public. Yes. They're, pu they're publicly funded. So I, I think where in Singapore we need to think a little bit more is where we distinguish the line between public funding, um, and um, you know. Where partis where partisan interests come in, um, I think there is a difference between the state and the party in Singapore. Um, political parties seek uh, office, uh, the PAP included, uh, but that's what they do. They try to win people over. But things that are publicly funded uh, don't necessarily have that concern. The state does not have that concern. So, um, if our um media, whether broadcast or print. Um, you know, has a BBC like model or an NHK like model or a Deutsche Welle uh, type model. I have no problem with that. They um they do these outlets um they are public models that do provide high quality journalism. Um, and it's just very curious to me why that kind of an approach is has just not taken flight in Singapore. No, no, I sorry, I agree with Ian on this. Uh, and in fact, just to uh. Uh, cite the, the the other publicly funded uh, media organization, Media Corp. Uh, I think I think produces some fairly good stuff, uh, especially on on regional issues. Uh, CNA I think has a very good website, uh, uh, and uh, you know, on, on many stories uh, does a much better job than the Straits Times. So it's not necessarily the case that a state funded media organization cannot produce quality journalism. Uh, I think the the problems is with the Straits Times is specific to, to the organization for reasons that are, you know, I think too complex for me to go into uh, today. Uh, and it certainly is possible uh, to turn it around under the present setup, but you have to make some, I think, fairly uh, major uh, changes uh, in, in the organization. I want to uh, return to a point that uh, Fukuang raised at the very start and, and get your the, the other panelists' sense of this. Uh, I mean, we're used to thinking of um, uh, party politics in Singapore as basically being PAP versus opposition. But uh, he, uh, Fukuang pointed out, uh, at least anecdotally, it seems as if there are PAP members themselves, perhaps a, a different generation, who feel unsettled, that's the word uh, that they use. Um, by uh, uh, things that they see happening. I mean, you, you mentioned in particular the ride out scandal, but um, uh, you know, I've actually heard these uh, you know intimations of dissatisfaction about the direction of the PAP uh, emerge from for some years. And I'm wondering whether the the other panelists um, can chime in on this. You know, what what is the um, 
uh, the state of a uh, party that, uh, you know, until fairly recently was, you know, epitomized cohesion and solidarity. Uh, is, is it necessarily a bad thing that is becoming a more normal party with uh, internal um, uh, contradictions and uh, disagreements? Or would that be too much for Singapore to handle? I think it stumped everybody, Charian. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll leave that there then as, a, <laughs> as an existential question to ponder through. Maybe time. I can uh, try to try stab at it. Yeah, carry on. Yeah, so in terms of uh, this perceived, rumoured, uh, hypothetical, let's say, the uh, dissatisfaction rising within uh, the PAP uh, amongst its members, um, I think it's a normal thing for many uh, political parties in the world to have dissatisfied members, right? So the only question is uh, whether this dissatisfaction is rising to enough levels, right, that it threatens the uh, unity of the party, that some party members may feel that they want to break party discipline, right? That, that's quite worrying uh, for any political party, right? Not just PAP. And then of course, the second question is like, why, right? Why are these people uh, becoming more uh, dissatisfied? Maybe I posit a potential explanation. Again, I have no evidence for it, but one potential explanation for growing dissatisfaction within uh, the party, if there is, is that maybe the party can do more in terms of the diversity of its leadership, right? Um, so if I look at the PAP Central Executive Committee, um, of course, there is uh, some women. Uh, I can count four women. Uh, but that's not a lot, right? So there's, uh, including the co-opted members, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. There's, amongst a CC of 20, there's four women, right? Um, and amongst the four women, there is only one non-Chinese woman that is uh, Minister Indrani Raja, right? So it could be that um, potentially greater diversity within its leadership might provide uh, more voices to the leadership um, and might provide a uh, better articulation of you know, different policy viewpoints, different political viewpoints, uh, which might potentially lead to like better representation of what party members want. So I take it very seriously that, you know, in the recent PAP conference that uh, Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Wong said that the PAP is a party for all, right? And we want to be as inclusive as possible. And I totally agree with him. The, the PAP is a, a classic catch-all party. And it should, as a party that is dominant in the Singapore political, political system, it should try to be as uh, inclusive as, as representation uh, as, as, uh, as much as possible, right? Um, and so I hope uh, that in, in, in the CEC and in, its, in the cabinet, uh, if a future Lawrence Wong cabinet materializes, that it will include a more uh, diverse uh, representation, not just in terms of race, uh, or gender, it could be in terms of religion, it could be in terms of, you know, where they went to school, <laughs> it, could, it could be in terms of oh, other that, things. Oh, that's a sacred cow. <laughs> oh, that, yeah. Doesn't it all have to be from our right? Well, okay, can so I... That, can that I just, uh, just, that's, that's a hypothesis. Right. Can, can I jump yeah. in? I think, I, I think there's another way to look at political parties, right? Um, I mean, essentially... Political parties, yes, they want to seek office, but in a way, they're also um, they're also brokers. They're brokers between different um interests, right? And to the ex to the extent that they are able to put together um as large a coalition as they can um to for those sort of interests to sort of log roll, um, you know, helps them win office. So I think in Singapore sometimes, uh, what 
we don't see is how the sausage gets made. Um, so I think like any political party, uh, there are actually different voices uh, uh, in the PAP. The PAP gets lobbied. This may seem very surprising to some people, but if you look at, say, industry associations talking to the PAP, sometimes you see this uh, being reported in the press. That's actually lobbying happening. Uh, it means that there's a certain constitu constituency that the PAP is trying to appeal to or you know is represented within the PAP itself. So I think when Chairman talked about moving to a towards a more normal politics i think we should also be we should also understand the sort of brokerage role that political parties play and i would rather have the sort of different interests different platforms hash things out in a more public manner than behind closed doors i think um we owe it to each other as citizens uh to have a more open political process right um and so Insofar as there are rumblings of dissatisfaction within the PAP, I think that's pretty normal in the sense that the PAP is just at a point where you know its coalition is negotiating with itself on how to move forward, uh, and it shouldn't be surprising. Um, I think we've been insulated from regular politics so much in Singapore that we take for granted that all these happen in the background, they happen automatically, they don't. Um, and I think um, as a pol as a polity that's maturing, um, the faster we understand how these things work and how we as citizens can have our voice, uh, the better it is for everybody. Wonderful. Uh, this, it's a good uh, uh, point to mention a question from uh, Simon Long. Uh, how concerned are you that taking part in a panel such as this might cause professional difficulties to you? And I think uh, uh, Ian's uh, remarks earlier uh, kind of answered that indirectly. I, I think uh, I probably speak for everyone in the room that, you know, we kind of see this our responsibility uh, to uh, to sort of be the change that we want to see, right? To, to For a uh, more active and engaged uh, citizen. Karen, who's that behind you? I'm kidding. <laughs> Always got my back. Thank you. But <laughs> uh, I see. So, final, so final, sorry, sorry final just, just one yes. minute. Sure. Um, I so I work at the National University of Singapore, and it's a public university, and so I see my salary as being paid by public taxpayers, right? And I see a responsibility for me to not just you know undergrad edu uh, uh, educate undergraduates who are vast majority ninety percent. Uh, are Singaporeans, but also to uh, do a little bit of public uh, education where I can. Um, and so these kind of uh, platforms are important. And um, so I, I do see it as part of uh, uh, public education as, a, as my role and responsibility in a publicly right. funded university. Right. I mean, being Elvis, yeah, yeah. we are at a publicly funded university um, and bring discussions out in the open in a public. I mean, to be to be funded by taxpayers means that we have an obligation to taxpayers. This means that we should serve the public interest, not partisan interest. I think there's a, there should be a very clear line there. And partisan, not meaning to say that we shouldn't be serving any partisan interest in our in our public role. Um, and and hence that sort of public education and public facing side of education is as important as our sort of regular sort of um, work with uh, students. And let's hope more uh, academics think like you gentlemen. As, as a final round of questions, because we are running uh, quickly running out of time, I'm going to ask you, uh, four of you, to comment uh, on changes at the very top and the very bottom, so to speak, of, of Singapore politics. Uh, starting with uh, Pat Sukwang and, and Elvin, I mean, one thing we know for sure next year, more or less, uh, is that there's going to be an event almost as rare as uh, the Haley's Comet, which is a change of prime minister in Singapore. Uh, Lee Sen Lung will step aside. Uh, simple question, what do you think his legacy will be um, in a few lines? <laughs> Elvin? Well, so I, uh, I'm, I guess I'm still a bit youngish. Uh, so I, I could say like I grew up in you know, Lee Sen Lung, Singapore. Um, I would say the the prime minister's uh, legacy is a little bit uh will for me will consist of two strands which may be a bit uh contradictory and so one of the first strands is that uh is associated with 
the increasing globalization, integration, and neoliberalization of the Singapore's economy, right? Where you have um, things like the integrated resorts, where you have uh, things like, you know, a growing foreign labor workforce, uh, and a lot of uh, marketization, uh, a growing capitalism, uh, sense of capitalism uh, that is growing within the Singapore economy. But also at the same time, on the other hand, um, a small but growing uh, redistributive welfare state, right? With a lot of different uh, new policies like CPF Life, uh, MediShield uh, Life, um, they have the Merdeka and Vajula generation uh, redistributive packages. Uh, and I, so I see these two um, strands of uh, uh, policy strands of um, uh, 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 of the Lee Long government as uh, impacting the everyday lives of Singaporeans very strongly. Um, so just just my simple thoughts. Thank you, uh, Fuqua. Yeah. Uh, so I think on his achievement for Singapore, I would say it's largely positive in terms of economic development, standard of living healthcare, education, housing, uh, you know, of course, there are, there are issues in each of these areas, but uh, on the whole, uh, throughout his, it will be 20 years uh, by next year, 20 years as prime minister. Uh, I, think he, I think he has done well, well for Singapore. Uh, and on the international uh, front, I think Singapore is usually spoken of it fairly highly, you know, as a safe, secure place, efficient government uh, where things work. On where we, we would place him as a political leader, uh, I think it will be a bit mixed. Uh, he obviously is not the strong man leader that his father was, you know, decisive and uh, purposeful and, and forceful. Uh, and, 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 and very determined to, 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 to get things done the way he wants it to be done. And he also is not the sort of leader that uh, I suppose the ordinary Singaporeans can in a way identify with in the way that Go Chok Tong was, you know, uh, the way he speaks, uh, you know, not so, not so atas uh, like, uh, like Lee Hsien Loong. Uh, so what sort of leader will people see him in future years? I, 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 I'm not, I think it will be a mixed uh, picture, but certainly on his achievement for Singapore, I think they, they were noteworthy. Okay, and, and uh, Rebecca and Ian, I'm going to ask you about uh, changes um, at the so-called bottom of society, even though, of course, all Singaporeans are equal. Uh, bearing in mind that we are a diverse uh, country and there's no such thing as the average Singaporean, uh, are there um, gradual, subtle changes that you've seen in Singaporeans' values and uh, national identity that might shape uh, politics in Singapore? I'll, I'll uh, go, go first. Oh, hi. Okay. Um, I think there's been claims, I mean, I disagree with the binary, but there's been claims that that we're seeing a shift away from what's considered sort of material values to sort of post-materialism. Um, I'm not super fond of that binary, um, but I think the idea of, um, we are seeing seeing a shift towards um, more concern uh, beyond just the immediate material concerns. Um, so things like, for example, questions of the environment um, that we are seeing, and I think the, the government's kind of, kind of, putting that ear to that. Um, so things like the climate, climate rallies that have been going on, um, increasing questions, of course, of of where Singapore is in the world. Um, so just sort of anecdotally talking to students about, you know, um, I think there were, there were questions in the chat as well about, you know, Singapore and response to things like the Gaza crisis, right? Where do Singaporeans fit within that that discussion? And so I think there there is increasing, I mean, some people might call it sort of wokeness, um, but there's there's a sense that you know Singapore is more than just Singaporeans are more than just their individual material interests, the individual immediate individual interests, uh, material uh, you know five Cs whatever have you. Uh, we care about more than just ourselves, so questions of inclusivity, but also beyond Singapore as well. Um, so you know Singapore is not developed, you know, and and we kind of um, uh, in the international community, you know, that there's this concern about you know what does that mean. Um, but also we're we're looking at global issues. 
uh, and saying, you know, what does Singapore have uh, both to contribute, but also to to learn about the rest of the world. So things like climate change and the need for cooperation on that front. So I do think that there, there's a shift in some of those views um, away from kind of immediate atomistic interests. Um, and I think that that's going to change some of the some of the discussions that we have around questions of uh, redistribution that we talked about earlier, but also thinking about future generations and sustainability and those sorts of uh, discussions um, that we're having that we haven't really had a whole lot of discussion around uh, around public policy surrounding you know being greener, uh, uh, caring about uh, climate change. Um, so those those are sorts of changes I think in values, not merely something that's spearheaded by the government, but also we see from from the ground up uh, initiatives as well. Ian. So I think we've seen some shifts, right? We've seen the decriminalization of male homosexuality, um, which we should have done a long time ago. Um, I think on the ground, there is more awareness of a responsibility that we as uh, Singaporeans have towards um, low-wage migrant labor that we bring here. Uh, so that's uh, that's some of the ground-up initiative. Uh, some of the um, environmental issues, as, as Rebecca had mentioned, is also very much ground up. Um, I I think though uh, we uh, as a society still have some way to go because I think that if we are talking about a Singapore society that is more inclusive in a meaningful way um, that bring that that has more public participation uh, there needs to be uh, more sharing of um, publicly collected information uh, my my friend Shannon Lang has talked about this at length I uh, and that allows citizens to take part in a fuller way because they have more knowledge at their fingertips. I think to also allow citizens to you know, bring up issues that they care about, because right now it seems sort of distant you know, through, through the sort of once a month parliamentary uh, uh, sittings. And this is important because one way of thinking about sustainability, uh, in addition to the environmental issues that Rebecca talked about, right, it's how to get people to have buy-in. Um, and to have buy-in is more than just a transaction. Um, it has to be that people are able to participate and feel ownership over uh, the polity, over legislation, so the laws, um, over policies. And that's something that I think we can go towards more. That's something that I think the uh, Lee Shin Long administration has left for his successors to take on. Thanks so much. Uh, so with that, uh, it's my um, the only thing I have to do left is to thank uh, our four speakers for joining us, uh, thank the audience uh, on behalf of uh, Academia SG and the Malaysian Singapore Association of Australia. Um, uh, we wish you um, a great holiday season um, and more boring years to come. <laughs> bye bye to all. Thank you.